So now let's consider, knowing this bare basic, uh, let's consider a case study in detail. And surprise, surprise, the case study we will consider is face perception and the development of the fusiform face area. Okay, so we're going to do a big long rigmarole about development of the face system. Uh, and I sort of mentioned this, the spoiler alert is, it's, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like on the basic question, we really want to know how much of face perception is innate. I just couldn't figure out how to make that summary slide. So there's, but there's lots of tantalizing evidence every which way on this. Okay, so um, let's consider, let's start with behavioral uh, considerations of uh, how face perception develops. And I'm gonna show you a movie of a newborn monkey. And I want you to just watch the movie and think about what, if anything, you can figure out about how much of face perception is innate, okay? So this is a 72-hour-old baby monkey with a person holding them, or another person holding them and another person looking, and you can just watch. Oops, okay. Sleepy. Experimenter's opening his mouth. He starts moving his mouth. Okay, what do, you, what do you learn from this? What does this suggest? Is face perception innate? Shokova, what, what do you think? I think so. What, why, what do you see? What makes you think? So it's started tracking and mimicking what it's seeing. <laughs> so I think yes, I would say. Okay, anybody have another thought on this? Yes, Lauren. Since it, like since the monkey is mimicking the guy, um, I guess it would have to recognize that it is a face and that it also has a corresponding face. Pretty interesting, isn't it? So you know, your first, so probably many of you had, had, had many of these reactions. First of all, as Shokova says, it looks like something must be innate here. But then you might think, well, maybe it's just anything that's moving. Maybe the baby monkey would track anything moving. After all, the experimenter keeps putting his face right in front of this little dude and like moving around. Maybe anything you put there, he would track, right? But then the third point is Lauren's, which is a very deep point. If it's true that the baby monkey was actually copying the face motion of the experimenter, that suggests a whole bunch of stuff. How would this baby monkey one, understand that that's a face movement, and two, connect it to their own ability to move their own face. Wow, right? Turns out human infants do something kind of like that too, okay? So here you see a whole microcosm of all the kind of tantalizing data and the ambiguity of multiple interpretations, and this is what it is. Okay, all right. Okay, so, um, the people have kind of carved out views about the development of face perception. And um, much like political views, if you run um, dimensionality reduction on them, they reduce to one line. It happens in science too. For some reason, people don't have complex theoretical spaces where they inhabit every point. They tend to like carve out these distinct bits. Um, and so um, one view is that we must start with some very simple kind of precursor that must be innate. And then we have a learning system that takes it from there, right? So one version of this view argues that there's some kind, you have to be born with some kind of template that makes you look at faces more than other things, right? But then once you build in that template and get a developing organism to look at faces a lot, the cortex can learn from experience and do the rest. Okay, so this is like the minimalist kind of nativist view. There's something innate, but it's maybe pretty rudimentary, okay? On the other end of the spectrum, you might think, 
maybe we're born with the full adult-like face processing system, its full representational capacity, and maybe we just need like a little bit of tuning, right? Even extreme nativists, would, would, most of them would agree that experience will do something, but maybe just fine tuning of the system. Okay, and so there's all kinds of views in between. Okay. So what kind of data would enable us to choose between these, right? Or find our position on that spectrum or better yet, carve out some other position not on the standard spectrum. Um, well, obviously one of the things you need to know is what is present at birth, right? Or as close as we can get to birth. Okay, that will obviously constrain this question. And your first instinct might be, okay, whatever's present at birth is innate. And that's mostly true, at least for the visual system, because not much visual input gets in, but even that people debate. Um, if you're studying the development of auditory processing, you have more trouble because actually lots of experience happens. Uh, you get nice sound conduction through the womb, and so that's more of a complicated mess. But for a first approximation, stuff that's present at birth is mostly a name. Okay? However, importantly, the opposite does not hold. So if something doesn't appear until, say, age 12, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a result of experience. It might, but it might not be. After all, think about puberty, right? Puberty happens around age 12, but it's not the result of experience. I mean, you gotta eat to stay alive and some basic inputs like that. But it's basically programmed. It's very genetically programmed. So similarly, it's possible that some of the stuff that happens at, after birth in the brain is part of a genetic program that's innately genetically specified and not the result of experience. And that gums up reasoning a whole lot. But I think the inference is stronger one direction. If it's present at birth, it's probably innate, except for auditory stuff and some other things. But the converse is not as strong. If something happens later, we have to ask ourselves, was it the result of experience or maturation, programmed biological development? Everybody get that? It's kind of an important point. OK, lots of my colleagues don't get that. Yes, 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 well, yes, exactly. So what that reveals is these simple ideas of innate and learned aren't going to capture. There's going to be a whole bunch of complicated stuff, and that's one of them. So hang on to all of those, OK? OK, so anyway, clearly constraining this question is what's present at birth, despite the complexities of the inferences. Second of all, we want to know how the system changes over time after birth biologically, psychologically, the whole bit. But third, what we really want to know is not just how does, it, how does it change, like what happens at what time point, at what age of development, but what are the causal roles of experience and biological maturation or genetically programmed stuff in that change that happens after birth. Okay, that's what we, this is what we really want to know to understand development. And that puts us in a real pickle because generally, these things are deeply confounded. After you're born, there's lots of biological maturation and there's lots of learning, and they're totally confounded with each other, and so it's very, very hard to pick them apart. Everybody see how that's a, that's a challenge? We might show that something arises at age five, right, and not before, and that's very tantalizing, but it doesn't tell us whether it's the product of experience or biological maturation, or as the usual story, some very complex stew of both of them interacting with each other. Okay, okay. So we can ask these three questions, the initial state at birth, how things change after birth, and the causal roles of experience and maturation in those changes, both of the brain and of the mind. Okay, and hopefully someday we'll achieve scientific nirvana and we'll all come together into some fabulous story. As I forewarned you, it hasn't yet, um, but we will start with um, behavioral data. Okay.